This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Chapter 1, Part 1 of The Ragged Trousered Philanthropists This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines The Ragged Trousered Philanthropists by Robert Tressel Chapter 1, Part 1 An Imperial Banquet a philosophical discussion, the mysterious stranger, Britons never shall be slaves. The house was named the Cave. It was a large old-fashioned three-storied building, standing in about an acre of ground, and situated about a mile outside the town of Mugsborough. It stood back nearly two hundred yards from the main road, and was reached by means of a by-road or lane, on each side of which was a hedge formed of hawthorn trees and blackberry bushes. This house had been unoccupied for many years, and it was now being altered and renovated for its new owner by the firm of Rushton & Co., builders and decorators. There were altogether about twenty-five men working there, carpenters, plumbers, plasterers, bricklayers and painters, besides several unskilled labourers. New floors were being put in where the old ones were decayed, and upstairs two of the rooms were being made into one by demolishing the parting wall and substituting an iron girder. Some of the window frames and sashes were so rotten that they were being replaced. Some of the ceilings and walls were so cracked and broken that they had to be replastered. Openings were cut through walls, and doors were being put where no doors had been before. Old broken chimney-pots were being taken down, and new ones were being taken up and fixed in their places. All the old whitewash had to be washed off the ceilings, and all the old paper had to be scraped off the walls preparatory to the house being repainted and decorated. The air was full of the sounds of hammering and sawing, the ringing of trowels and the rattle of pails, the splashing of water-brushes, and the scraping of the stripping knives used by those who were removing the old wallpaper. Besides being full of these, the air was heavily laden with dust and disease germs, powdered mortar, lime, plaster, and the dirt that had been accumulating within the old house for years. In brief, those employed there might be said to be living in a tariff-reform paradise. They had plenty of work. At twelve o'clock Bob Crass, the painter's foreman, blew a blast upon a whistle, and all the hands assembled in the kitchen, where Bert the apprentice had already prepared the tea which was ready in the large galvanized iron pail that he had placed in the middle of the floor. By the side of the pail were a number of old jam-jars, mugs, dilapidated teacups, and one or two empty condensed milk-tins. Each man on the job paid Bert threepence a week for the tea and sugar. They did not have milk, and although they had tea at breakfast-time as well as at dinner, the lad was generally considered to be making a fortune. Two pairs of steps laid parallel on their sides at a distance of about eight feet from each other, with a plank laid across, in front of the fire, several upturned pails and the drawers belonging to the dresser, formed the seating accommodation. The floor of the room was covered with all manner of debris, dust, dirt, fragments of old mortar and plaster. A sack containing cement was leaning against one of the walls, and a bucket containing some stale whitewash stood in one corner. As each man came in, he filled his cup, jam-jar, or condensed milk-tin with tea from the steaming pail before sitting down. Most of them brought their food in little wicker baskets, which they held on their laps, or placed on the floor beside them. At first there was no attempt at conversation, and nothing was heard but the sounds of eating and drinking, and the drizzling of the bloater which Easton, one of the painters, was toasting on the end of a pointed stick at the fire. "'I don't think much of this bloody tea.' suddenly remarked Sawkins, one of the labourers. "'Well, it ought to be all right,' retorted Bert. "'It's been boiling ever since half-past eleven. Bert White was a frail-looking, weedy, pale-faced boy, fifteen years of age and about four feet nine inches in height. His trousers were part of a suit that he had once worn for best, but that was so long ago that they had become too small for him, fitting rather tightly and scarcely reaching the top of his patched and broken hobnailed boots.' The knees and the bottoms of the legs of his trousers had been patched with square pieces of cloth, several shades darker than the original fabric, and these patches were now all in rags. His coat was several sizes too large for him, and hung about him like a dirty, ragged sack. He was a pitiable spectacle of neglect and wretchedness as he sat there upon an upturned pail, 
eating his bread and cheese with fingers that, like his clothing, were grimed with paint and dirt. "'Well, then, you can't have put enough tea in, or else you've been using up what was left yesterday,' continued Sawkins. "'Why the bloody hell don't you leave the boy alone?' said Harlow, another painter. "'If you don't like the tea, you needn't drink it. For my part, I'm sick of listening to you about it every damn day.' "'It's all very well for you to say I needn't drink it,' answered Sawkins. "'But I've paid my share, and I've got a right to an express an opinion. "'It's my belief that half the money we gives him is spent in penny horribles. "'He's always got one in his hand. "'And to make what tea he does buy last, "'he collects all the slops what's left and boils it up day after day.' "'No, I don't,' said Bert, who was on the verge of tears. "'It's not me what buys the things at all. "'I gives all the money I gets to Crass, and he buys em himself.' So there. At this revelation, some of the men furtively exchanged significant glances, and Crass, the foreman, became very red. You better keep your bloody truppence, or make your own tea after this week, he said, addressing Sawkins, and then perhaps we'll have a little peace at meal times. And you needn't ask me to cook no bloaters or bacon for you no more, added Bert tearfully, cause I won't do it. Sawkins was not popular with any of the others. When about twelve months previously he first came to work for Rushton and Co., he was a simple labourer, but since then he had picked up a slight knowledge of the trade, and having armed himself with a putty knife and put on a white jacket, regarded himself as a fully qualified painter. The others did not perhaps object to him trying to better his conditions, but his wages, fivepence an hour, were twopence an hour less than the standard rate, and the result was that, in slack times, often a better workman was stood off when Sawkins was kept on. Moreover, he was generally regarded as a sneak who carried tales to the foreman and the bloke. Every new hand who was taken on was usually warned by his new mates not to let that bugger Sawkins see anything. The unpleasant silence which now ensued was at length broken by one of the men, who told a dirty story and in the laughter and applause that followed, the incident of the tea was forgotten. "'How did you get on yesterday?' asked Crass, addressing Bundy, the plasterer, who was intently studying the sporting columns of the Daily Obscurer. "'No luck,' replied Bundy gloomily. "'I had a bob each way on Stockwell in the first, but it was scratched before the start.' This gave rise to a conversation between Crass, Bundy, and one or two others, concerning the chances of different horses in the morrow's races. It was Friday, and no one had much money, so at the suggestion of Bundy a syndicate was formed, each member contributing threepence, for the purpose of backing a dead certainty given by the renowned Captain Kiddam of the Obscurer. One of those who did not join the syndicate was Frank Owen, who was, as usual, absorbed in a newspaper. He was generally regarded as a bit of a crank, for it was felt that there must be something wrong about a man who took no interest in racing or football, and was always talking a lot of rot about religion and politics. If it had not been for the fact that he was generally admitted to be an exceptionally good workman, they would have had little hesitation about thinking that he was mad. This man was about thirty-two years of age, and of medium height, but so slightly built that he appeared taller. There was a suggestion of refinement in his clean-shaven face, but his complexion was ominously clear, and an unnatural colour flushed the thin cheeks. There was a certain amount of justification for the attitude of his fellow workmen, for Owen held the most unusual and unorthodox opinions on the subjects mentioned. The affairs of the world are ordered in accordance with orthodox opinions. If any one did not think in accordance with these, he soon discovered this fact for himself. Owen saw that in the world a small class of people were possessed of a great abundance and superfluity of the things that are produced by work. He also saw that a very great number, in fact the majority of the people, lived on the verge of want, and that a smaller but still very large number lived lives of semi-starvation from the cradle to the grave, while a yet smaller but still very great number actually died of hunger, or, maddened by privation, killed themselves and their children in order to put a period to their misery. And strangest of all, in his opinion, he saw that people who enjoyed abundance of the things that are made by work were the people who did nothing, and that the others, who lived in want or died of hunger, were the people who worked. And seeing all this, he thought that it was wrong, 
that the system that produced such results was rotten and should be altered, and he had sought out and eagerly read the writings of those who thought they knew how it might be done. It was because he was in the habit of speaking of these subjects that his fellow workmen came to the conclusion that there was probably something wrong with his mind. When all the members of the syndicate had handed over their contributions, Bundy went out to arrange matters with the bucky, and when he had gone, Easton annexed the copy of the Obscure that Bundy had thrown away, and proceeded to laboriously work through some carefully cooked statistics relating to free trade and protection. Bert, his eyes starting out of his head and his mouth wide open, was devouring the contents of a paper called The Chronicles of Crime. Ned Dawson, a poor devil who was paid fourpence an hour for acting as mate or labourer to Bundy, or the bricklayers, or anyone else who wanted him, lay down on the dirty floor in a corner of the room, and with his coat rolled up as a pillow, went to sleep. Sawkins, with the same intention, stretched himself at full length on the dresser. Another who took no part in the syndicate was Barrington, a labourer who, having finished his dinner, placed the cup he brought for his tea back into his dinner-basket, took out an old briar-pipe which he slowly filled, and proceeded to smoke in silence. Some time previously the firm had done some work for a wealthy gentleman who lived in the country some distance outside Mugsborough. This gentleman also owned some property in the town, and it was commonly reported that he had used his influence with Rushton to induce the latter to give Barrington employment. It was whispered amongst the hands that the young man was a distant relative of the gentleman's, and that he had disgraced himself in some way and been disowned by his people. Rushton was supposed to have given him a job in the hope of currying favour with his wealthy client, from whom he hoped to obtain more work. Whatever the explanation of the mystery may have been, the fact remained that Barrington, who knew nothing of the work except what he had learned since he had been taken on, was employed as a painter's labourer at the usual wages, fivepence per hour. He was about twenty-five years of age, and a good deal taller than the majority of the others, being about five feet ten inches in height, and slenderly though well and strongly built. He seemed very anxious to learn all that he could about the trade, and although rather reserved in his manner, he had contrived to make himself fairly popular with his workmates. He seldom spoke unless to answer when addressed, and it was difficult to draw him into conversation. At meal-times, as on the present occasion, he generally smoked, apparently lost in thought and unconscious of his surroundings. Most of the others also lit their pipes, and a desultory conversation ensued. "'Is the gent what's bought this house any relation to Sweater, the draper?' asked Payne, the carpenter's foreman. "'It's the same bloke,' replied Crass. "'Didn't he used to be in the town council or something?' "'He's been on the council for years,' returned Crass. "'He's on it now. He's mayor this year. He's been mayor several times before.' "'Let's see,' said Payne reflectively. "'He married old Grinder's sister, didn't he? You know who I mean, Grinder, the greengrocer.' "'Yes, I believe he did,' said Crass. "'It wasn't Grinder's sister,' chimed in old Jack Linden. "'It was his niece. I know because I remember walking in there house just after they was married, about ten year ago.' "'Oh, yes, I remember now,' said Payne. "'She used to manage one of Grinder's old branch shops, didn't she?' "'Yes,' replied Linden. "'I remember it very well, because there was a lot of talk about it at the time.' By all accounts, old Sweater used to be a regular hot one. No one ever thought as he'd ever get married at all. There were some funny yarns about several young women that used to walk for him. This important matter being disposed of, there followed a brief silence, which was presently broken by Harlow. "'Funny name to call a house, ain't it?' he said. "'The Cave. I wonder what made him give it a name like that.' "'They calls him all sorts of outlandish names nowadays.' said old Jack Linden. "'There's generally some sort of meaning to it, though,' observed Payne. "'For instance, if a bloke backed a winner and made a pile, he might call his house Epsom Lodge or Newmarket Villa. "'Or sometimes there's a hoak tree or a cherry tree in the garden,' said another man. "'Then they calls it Hoak Lodge or Cherry Cottage.' "'Well, there's a cave up at the end of this garden,' said Harlow with a grin. "'You know, the cesspool.' "'what the drains of the house runs into. "'Perhaps they called it after that.' "'Talking about the drains,' said old Jack Linden, "'when the laughter produced by this elegant joke had ceased. 
Talking about the drains. I wonder what they're going to do about them. This house ain't fit to live in as they are now, and as for that bloody cesspool, it ought to be done away with. So it's going to be, replied Crass. There's going to be a new set of drains altogether, carried right out to the road and connected with the main. Crass really knew no more about what was going to be done in this matter than did Linden, but he felt certain that this course would be adopted. He never missed an opportunity for enhancing his own prestige with the men by insinuating that he was in the confidence of the firm. "'That's going to cost a good bit,' said Linden. "Eh, I suppose I will,' replied Crass. "'But money ain't no object to old Sweater. He's got tons of it. You know he's got a large wholesale business in London, and shops all over the bloody country, besides the one he's got here.' Easton was still reading the Obscurer. He was not able to understand exactly what the compiler of the figures was driving at. Probably the latter never intended that anyone should understand. But he was conscious of a growing feeling of indignation and hatred against foreigners of every description, who were ruining this country, and he began to think that it was about time we did something to protect ourselves. Still, it was a very difficult question. To tell the truth, he himself could not make head or tail of it. At length he said aloud, addressing himself to Crass, "'What do you think of this here physical policy, Bob?' I "'Ain't taught much about it,' replied Crass. "'I don't never worry my head about politics.' "'Much better left alone,' chimed in old Jack Linden sagely. "'Agrifying about politics generally ends up with a bloody row, and does no good to nobody.' At this there was a murmur of approval from several of the others. Most of them were averse from arguing or disputing about politics. If two or three men of similar opinions happened to be together, they might discuss such things in a friendly and superficial way, but in a mixed company it was better left alone. The physical policy emanated from the Tory party. That was the reason why some of them were strongly in favour of it, and for the same reason others were opposed to it. Some of them were under the delusion that they were conservatives. Similarly, others imagined themselves to be liberals. As a matter of fact, most of them were nothing. They knew as much about the public affairs of their own country as they did of the condition of affairs on the planet Jupiter. Easton began to regret that he had broached so objectionable a subject, when, looking up from his paper, Owen said, "'Does the fact that you never trouble your heads about politics prevent you from voting at election times?' No one answered, and there ensued a brief silence. Easton, however, in spite of the snub he had received, could not refrain from talking. "'Well, I don't go in for politics much either, but if what's in this here paper is true, it seems to me we ought to take some interest in it, when the country is being ruined by foreigners.' "'If you're going to believe all that's in that bloody rag, you'll want some salt,' said Harlow. The Obscura was a Tory paper, and Harlow was a member of the local Liberal Club. Harlow's remark roused Crass. "'What's the use of talking like that?' he said. "'You know very well that this country is being ruined by foreigners. Just go to a shop to buy something, look round the place, and you'll see that more than half the damned stuff comes from abroad. They're able to sell their goods here because they don't have to pay no duty. But they takes care to put every duties on our goods and keep them out of their countries, and I say it's about time it was stopped.' "'There, there.' said Linden, who always agreed with Crass, because the latter, being in charge of the job, had it in his power to put in a good or a bad word for a man to the boss. Here, here, now that's what I call common sense. Several other men, for the same reason as Linden, echoed Crass's sentiments, but Owen laughed contemptuously. Yes, it's quite true that we gets a lot of stuff from foreign countries, said Harlow, but they boys more from us than we do from them. "'Now you think you know a hell of a lot,' said Crass. "'How much more did they buy from us last year than we did from them?' Harlow looked foolish. As a matter of fact, his knowledge of the subject was not much wider than Crass's. He mumbled something about not having no head for figures, and offered to bring full particulars next day. "'You're what I call a bloody windbag,' continued Crass. "'You've got a hell of a lot to say, but when it comes to the point, you don't know nothing.' "'Why, even here in Mugsborough,' chimed in Sawkins who, though still lying on the dresser, had been awakened by the shouting, were overrun with them. Nearly all the waiters and the cook at the Grand Hotel, where we were working last month, is foreigners. Yes, said old Joe Philpot, tragically, and then there's them Italian organ grinders, 
and the blokes what sells hot chestnuts. And when I was going home last night, I see a lot of them Frenchies selling onions, and a little while after I met two more of them coming up the street with a bear. Notwithstanding the disquieting nature of this intelligence, Owen again laughed, much to the indignation of the others, who thought it was a very serious state of affairs. It was a damn shame that these people were allowed to take the bread out of English people's mouths. They ought to be driven into the bloody sea. End of chapter 1, part 1 This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.